Joining us today is Doug Hamilton, Waste Management Specialist in the Department of Biosystems and Agriculture Engineering. Well, Doug, I'm really excited about today's topic of worms. I know that might not excite everybody, but... Oh, um, very exciting subject. Absolutely. Um, before we, we're going to look at some vermicomposting, but mm -hmm. first I wanted to learn about just the benefits of, of earthworms in our garden soils and what they do for them. Well, the, the worms we're using, the, the compost worms, the Isonia fetida, basically what they can do in your garden is every day in mm -hmm. nature, they will go about 10 inches deep in the soil They'll eat up at the surface, and then they basically poo about 10 inches deep. So they can take the fertility on the surface and bring it below. Mm -hmm. In the wintertime in our garden here, we'll cover the surface of our garden with uh, just grass clippings from the yard. And by March or so, those worms are going to basically dissolve all this and put the fertility into the soil. You see that with your leaves. If you don't rake up all the leaves, they... they find but, their way underground. In right, the, and, the and by going through the mm -hmm. soil every day, they're aerating the soil too. Mm -hmm. So they bring in pore space and they also have a, a fertility. A lot of the fertility actually comes from the slime on the side of the, the worm. So they're actually leaving a trail of fertilizer oh. as they go down also. Well, in addition to just uh, existing worms, I know you use uh, vermicomposting. Well, basically vermicomposting mm -hmm. is very similar to microbial or normal composting, except for it's not a hot process. Mm -hmm. You're using the worms to do the composting for you. Uh, this is a particular system we use here. It's called canna worms. It, mm -hmm. it comes out of Australia. Um, it's a series of trays that have holes in the bottom and the worms have no trouble going through these holes. Mm -hmm. These are stacked up on top of each other and because the worms like to go through the soil we can feed them here at the top okay. and then the, the daytime and the nighttime they'll be eating on the surface and then they'll do their pooing just like they do in the garden. So they're, they're always turning this over. Um, now this is a commercial product but you can also make your own worm composting kit with a Right, you can, you can take a bucket, <laughs> use a 5 8 inch drill, mm -hmm. drill a bunch of holes in the bottom and stack those. And stack it inside of another bucket. Or um, you can just use a bucket and, and uh, you'll have to. harvest them. The, the nice thing about this is because the worms will do their thing, you never actually have to touch the worms. Excellent. Now let's look at how you go about the feeding process. Okay, okay. we basically use our kitchen scraps and shredded junk mail. Okay. I put the junk mail on the top and I take that away. I make them think that there's leaves on top of the forest mm -hmm. and then I'll just put <laughs> scraps, mm -hmm. spread them out a little and then I put the put the paper back on top. Mm -hmm. And now you're using your vegetative scraps from the kitchen. Right. Um, now you told me before you can use meat but then you get a certain smell with it. <laughs> right, people will tell you you can't use meat and dairy products. The worms will eat just about everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, we got at OSU, we got started in this with poultry litter. Okay. Uh, people think they won't eat poultry litter. We found they love poultry litter. You oh, put cool. enough paper or carbon with the poultry litter, they'll eat it like crazy. Now that's a difference from other composting is that you want um, a higher carbon content in it. Right. The, mm -hmm. The worms like the carbon content of C to N ratio about 50, 45 or 50. Uh, what's really good, if, like horse stall cleanings, you take this, the, uh, the, the manure and the, the, uh, the wood or whatever you're using for bedding, you shred that, you got the perfect mixture. Okay. Uh, regular compost likes a little bit lower C to N ratio. You want to have this higher because the worms will outcompete the rest of the guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'll have a good worm growth. Now I saw you took a thermometer out of this. Tell me about the temperatures that you're looking for? The biggest problem we have in Oklahoma is the worms are native to Western Europe, Northern and Western Europe. They like temperatures about 60 to 70 degrees. Okay. These guys will tolerate a little higher temperatures. They can tolerate up to 80, 85. But once it gets in the 90s, you'll start to have pretty massive die-offs. They do not like the hot temperatures. So that's one of the things we need to manage um, where we put the composter. Right. We want it in the shade. Mm -hmm. If you have a nice basement, if you mm -hmm. keep it in the basement, it'll be perfect all year round. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. In the summertime, you could have it inside in the air conditioning, but you do have a problem with flies. What we do here is we keep it on the shady side of the house, mm -hmm. the north side of the house, and in the, the summertime, we actually add when the weather forecast shows it to getting in the low 90s, uh, we usually add ice to the top. Oh. And that'll keep the temperature 
if you have that nice uh, paper layer underneath, that'll keep the temperature about 60, 70 degrees. It won't get too cold. Okay. And okay. then at night, it'll start to warm up again. You'll be right. keep it between 60 and 70 degrees so almost all the way through. you put that in the morning and keep it cool right. all day. Now the ice is melting and moving through there and there's some liquid coming off of that. E right. Even when you don't have ice, right? Right. Mm -hmm. In the wintertime, we keep this in our garage. In Oklahoma, we generally don't have trouble in the winter. Okay. Uh, the way these worms work in nature is they make it through the winter by reproducing very fast and they leave a lot of eggs or cocoons so they can make it through cold temperatures fine as long as it doesn't freeze solid and then you then even then you might have some cocoon survive but in the winter time when we're not adding much water we'll get about a gallon of tea a month mm -hmm. and we're adding the ice we get as much water as uh, that's uh, melting off the ice and the tea which comes off the bottom here is actually where your fertility is Okay, and that's a nice uh, aspect of this system is you have the spout on the bottom right. so you can extract that tea easily. We got a tea catcher there on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the tea. Mm -hmm. It's got a C to end ratio of about five. So okay. it's got good, uh, good stable nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, you can in the winter time, we'll have as much as 2% nitrogen in here. Mm -hmm. So we generally use this it's a little more diluted now because of, because the, of the, the ice, the extra water. In going the in. summertime, mm -hmm. um, it'll look like this because of the ice. We use it straight with our, our plants. Mm -hmm. In the wintertime, when it's stronger, we mix it about a five to one ratio of water. And since you're not putting it in the garden in the winter, you're storing it. Uh, you have a, a rain barrel, right? But I know that that's where you're storing We have a rain barrel that's just about full right now of tea. <laughs> and then we'll just pour it in here. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take the tea out of here, and we dilute that about three or five to one. It's a so little stronger. before you add it to the garden, uh, three or five parts water to one part tea. tea. Okay. Now, when you're applying this in the garden, are there any certain considerations you want to take in? You really, account? since this is stuff that came right out of our kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, you really need to think of this as, as like raw manure. Okay. For, uh, for food safety, do not apply it on your leafy greens. Uh, mm -hmm. Be sure and wash them once you do it. We usually put it below the soils or on the soil surface, like on our tomato plants and whatnot, and then be very careful to wash them. And what about root crops? Generally with root crops, uh, the root crops are fine, and a couple of weeks before we harvest it, we don't use any tea. Okay. I usually use the tea about like liquid fertilizer that you'd buy at the store. I put it on every two or three weeks. Okay. The and season. With the uh, tea, uh, is that your primary source of fertility for your gardens That's here? a primary source of fertility. We also have a compost mm -hmm. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. About a, once a month, we'll change this tray out and we'll dump that either. In the wintertime, we dump it right in the garden. In the summertime, we put it in our compost pile. Mm -hmm. We can show you how the, the worms will decompose. Yeah, let's look at one of these uh, soil layers. So this is... Uh, this, we've started this tray about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So this is what the material looks like, you know, as you're adding it. Fairly undecomposed. Mm -hmm. One, two weeks later, it's going to look like this. You see that there may be a few worms in here. I put a little extra compost because it does shrink. Okay. Um, but it starts to break down. You can still see paper. Mm -hmm. uh, within a month, Oh, wow. Is basically going to turn into compost. Mm -hmm. You can see that there, there are worms visible. There's actually about 10,000 worms in this bin. This uh, particular bin has about two square foot, so mm -hmm. we would start with two pounds of worms. Okay. These guys are very prolific breeders. They will double their biomass mm -hmm. every 80 days. So in two months, you start out with a pound of worm. If you're feeding them, you'll have two pounds of worm and then you'll have four pounds of worms. Okay, and what worm are we using in our uh, compost system? The worms we use are uh, Isenia fetida is the, the scientific word for them. Mm -hmm. uh, the most common name for them is red wigglers. Mm -hmm. They tend to be kind of small, mm -hmm. uh, smaller than uh, what we think of as the bait worms or the earthworms that you'll right. have in the front yard. Uh, what you'll see when they stretch out, they have stripes. Yeah, there's white bandings. Over white there. and brown banding. Mm. Another word for these, actually the name I like is the tiger worms, mm -hmm. because if you see that banding, you know they have the right, mm -hmm. right worm. They're about the only worms that have that banding. They also, as you saw when we mm -hmm. took the, 
the thing off, they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're bunch worms. Mm -hmm. A lot of the worms we have in the yard are burrowing worms. Okay. So the burrowing worms will have one burrow per worm. And they come up at night and they eat grass or, or vegetation, then they go back in the burrow. And they put castings, they, they take out the extra dirt and whatnot and put it up on the surface, they call that the castings. Mm -hmm. The problem with the burrowing worms is they need about a square foot per worm. Okay. Whereas mm -hmm. with this, we can put 3,000 worms per square foot. Much more efficient from with Much more efficient. composting. Um, you have a fact sheet about vermicomposting. There is a fact sheet mm -hmm. called vermicomposting or okay. composting with worms. Uh, we have a handout sheet that I'm turning into a fact sheet that has some of the tips that I have learned in oh. the four or five years that I've been doing it.